see is the battle You see my victory
Amen. God bless you for being here this morning. And uh, we're so excited to be together. You know, the scripture says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. How good and how pleasing it is. How beautiful when brothers and sisters dwell together in love and unity. And uh, you can read the scripture and you can pray and you can love Jesus all by yourself. But isn't it great to gather with people and be together and celebrate uh, God's goodness? The psalmist said it this way when they were on a trek, on a pilgrimage, on their way to Jerusalem. These are called psalms of ascent. It's when they're making their way from the villages, from the valley, up into the mountain, to the temple to celebrate and worship. He said, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will come with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. This is a psalm all about ascent. It's about elevating. It's about expectation. How many of you believe that if you know Christ as your Savior, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what happened yesterday, no matter what happens today or tomorrow, how many know the best is yet to come? The best is yet to come. You say, but pastor, I'm hurting, I'm struggling. That's okay. You just need to go climb up that mountain because those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. How many of you know that every problem you have is going to be solved? It's going to be in the rearview mirror. It's going to be buttoned down, wrapped up, finished, amen. In 10,000 years, every problem you've got on your mind right now is not going to be a problem. <clears throat> it's not going to be a problem. The things in life that seem urgent are seldom important. And the things in life that are truly important seldom seem urgent. But the most important thing you can do today, if you're here with us, or if you're joining us online, the most important thing we can do is start climbing up that hill. How many of you know that you don't have to do that all by yourself? That Jesus walked up that hill for you. The Bible says, I'm crucified with Christ and I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. You know what he's doing right now? He wants to draw you into his presence. He said, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Wherever two or three gather in his name, he said, there I will be in your very midst. So let's bow our hearts together as we go to the Lord, as we go to that mountain this morning. Your word says, Father, that as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds Jerusalem his people. Thank you, Lord, today that we are not alone, that you are here, that you are with us, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. Lord, we pray today, some of us are hurting, some of us are discouraged, some of us are struggling, and Lord, today, we just thank you that we can come into your presence, and Lord, all our problems can fade into into the relief. We can focus on you. We can fix our eyes on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, thank you that you're the author of my faith. You began a good work in me. You begin a good work in us. And Lord, you are the finisher of my faith. You will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So Lord, today we come to worship. We come with expectation. We come with dreams and hopes and prayers and Lord some are asking for direction and some are just asking for strength Lord some are here just to celebrate just to bless your name and praise you for all that you have done for us but Lord there's some here today that are searching they're looking for something 
Father, today we pray that they would find it is someone whose name is Jesus. And Lord, you said if you were lifted up, you would draw all men to yourself. So Lord, in this moment, at this time, in this place, we want to lift up your name. And we pray that you would do your work of drawing our hearts toward you. Father, speak to us today. Meet us in this moment for Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray. Everybody said? Amen.
Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to continue our series called One Love. And we've been studying the book of Ephesians. In fact, on Easter Sunday, we're going to kick off a 28-day adventure and uh, in Ephesians chapter 2 that talks about how we've been made alive with Christ, how we've been raised to new life in Christ. And so I hope you'll be thinking and praying about maybe a friend you could invite. Next Sunday morning's Palm Sunday. Our kids are going to be in the service. They're going to be waving palm branches and singing for us. It's going to be unbelievable. Uh, Maya, we're going to have a guest worship artist next Sunday morning as well. As, is it Jasula? Did I say that correct? Help me say it right. Jasula. Did I get it right today? Awesome. Hey, let's welcome her. Thank you so much for, for helping lead us today, and uh, so we're so appreciative of you being here. We're going to have guests next Sunday morning as well. Easter Sunday morning is going to be awesome. We're going to kick off this new series for 28 days. If you'll make a commitment to daily devotion, faithful fellowship, weekly worship, this 28 days can be a life-changing experience. For 28 days, we'll have daily readings. We're going to read the whole book of Ephesians in 28 days. How many of you would be nervous about saying, I'm going to read the whole book of Ephesians from start to finish? How many of you know how to eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Ephesians isn't that big of a book. It's only six chapters. If you break it into 28 days, it's just a few verses a day. It's something anybody can do. And how many of you think seven minutes in heaven is a great way to start your day? Just getting alone with God, reading a few verses of scripture, praying, get your day started off right, get your week started off right. So on Easter Sunday, we're going to kick off 28 days. 
We'll have a little booklet for you that you can read along and, and write some notes and prayer requests. There'll be a place where you can fill in the blanks. Every Sunday for the next four weeks, we'll be teaching through Ephesians 2 and chapter 5. And we'll be learning about this one love that can bring us new life and new hope in Christ. How many of you think coming to church every Sunday, reading the scripture every day, and going to a grace group, a small group, having fellowship, uh, gathering around God's word and discussing what we talked about in the message from the scripture and from the sermon. How many of you think if you did that for 28 days, it would make a difference in your life? Amen? How many of you think there's something you could do today to make your life worse? Mark, you, you didn't even hesitate. You said immediately, I, I know what I could do. We all know how we could stub our spiritual toes and skin our knees, and we all know how to mess up, right? Because choices have consequence. So we can make choices to make our life more difficult and to hurt us and challenge us. That means we can make choices to make our life better and to, to be blessed and to be encouraged. So I want to challenge you. Next Sunday morning, Palm Sunday, start thinking about those psalms of ascent and a sense of expectation and really preparing your heart. And how many of you think it would be a great idea if you're going to go to heaven, you ought to take somebody with you? Think that's a good idea? I want you to start thinking and praying about people you know, your neighbors, people at work, uh, people in your family, friends, people you play pickleball with, all, all your buddies, all your friends, people you share life with that, you're, that you know. Listen, most people, if a friend most people, if a trusted friend invited them to church on Easter Sunday, most people will say yes. So start thinking and praying. Does anybody have a name or a face that God's already brought to your mind just while we're sitting here talking? Start thinking about somebody you know who needs to know Christ and invite them and bring them. And by the way, next Saturday night, Maya, this place is going to be lit. It's going to be awesome. There's going to be a, a night of worship. We're going to have a guest artist that's going to be with us. The same guy who's going to be here Sunday morning is going to be with us Saturday night. I'm telling you, worship the next few weeks is going to be unbelievable, so I hope you'll be here. How many of you have got one of those flyers for the night of worship? We should have them out. There's hundreds of them in the foyer. Before you leave today, take a stack of them and give them out. Uh, invite your friends. So next Saturday night, <clears throat> worship. 7 p.m., it's going to be a concert, and it's going to be a concert for Jesus. So be here and be a part of it. And then Sunday morning, our kids are going to be singing in the service. Easter Sunday, we'll kick off our 28-day adventure of, uh, of one love and of, of growing closer to God. So I hope you'll be here and be a part of that. And uh, we're going to be starting some new small groups. So if you're already in a group, our groups are going to be going through this 28-day journey together. But if you're not in a group, or if you want to lead a group or host a group, we're going to have a meeting right after church today. Where's Pat Panera and Tanya Haywood? They're going to be with us. We're going to have a great meeting right here. God bless you. And so if you're a current leader, or if you've led a group in the past, or if you're open to the possibility, it's only four weeks just getting in and getting connected with, with some friends, maybe in your home or at work or wherever. We'll meet right after the service today, and, and you guys can be a part of that. We hope you'll do that. Also, this Wednesday at 11.30 a.m., Pastor Paul's hosting another one of our luncheons. Lunch at Grace Point, it's going to have a, a physician is going to be with us who's going to tell you how to reduce your chance of heart disease by 90%. Bonnie could do that right now. She'd just say, don't eat anything that Stephen eats. <laughs> and your chances of, of those problems. But we've got flyers out all over the room. So be with us this Wednesday if you can get away. Join us for lunch in the fellowship hall, 1130. It's going to be an awesome time. And, uh, and I know Pastor Paul will be excited uh, for you to be there and bring a friend. Now, what are we going to talk about today? We've been walking through Ephesians. We've come to chapter 4. And the idea of this whole series, one love, comes out of these verses that we're going to read this morning. I've been waiting for this passage for, for about four and a half weeks now. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. 
He says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, how do you do that? He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3. I think maybe it'd be a good idea. Why don't we read this verse out loud together? Are you with me? Verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He says there's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, would you speak to us today by your spirit, through your word, would you encourage us to live out this truth that we might experience your grace in a deeper way And that, Lord, we would also change the world one life at a time for the glory of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. One love. How many of you believe that we are living in the divided states of America? There's only one thing that everybody agrees on, and that is we are a divided people. It was Abraham Lincoln in 1858 who famously quoted Jesus of Nazareth. And in a political speech when he was running for the Senate in Illinois, this unknown country lawyer uh, <clears throat> gave a, gave a, was at a debate with a famous silver-tongued United States Senator named Stephen Douglas. And Abraham Lincoln was this no-name, all shucks, homespun, uh, country lawyer, kind of Atticus Finch against <clears throat> Daniel Webster. It was Abraham Lincoln against Stephen Douglas. And Lincoln said famously about the issue of slavery and, and where, what the future held for the, for the United States. Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. You know what a lot of people don't know? How many of you think that's a pretty good line? It has lasted the test of time. Half the people in this room don't even know who Stephen Douglas is. He was a lot more famous than Abraham Lincoln in 1858. And yet, Lincoln's words, the house divided against itself cannot stand, his words live today And the the memory of Stephen Douglas is in history books and political junkies know about him. What you may not know is that when Lincoln gave that great speech, you know what happened? Not very much. He lost that race against Stephen Douglas. But two years later, what he did in that race And in those famous debates, made him the nominee of his party for president, and he became the president of the United States. And Abraham Lincoln is widely regarded as the greatest president in American history because he saved the Union. He saved the Union. We have a longing for belonging. Friends, it's deep. It's hardwired. It's embedded. It's it's in your processing. It's in your system. You need, we need each other. Did you know that morning talk shows, have you ever noticed, if you listen to the radio in the morning, have you ever noticed that there's like three or four people that are supposedly gathered around a table? And have you ever noticed how they're the funniest people alive? Because everything that everyone says 
Everyone else just cackles like a hyena. Kind of like that, right there. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate that help. Did you notice how hearing one person laugh made everything seem funnier than it really was? How many of you are aware that a lot of that laughter is canned? But you can't help it. It, it makes you smile. You know what the morning show format is across America? It's the same format on every show. And by the way, it's the same on The View. It's the same on Live with Mark and Kelly or Kelly and Mark or, or that show. It's the same on Howard Stern. It's the same on every show. Elvis in the morning. Whatever show you listen to, it's always an ensemble cast. Did you know the only person who was ever famous in radio for sitting in a room all by themselves was Rush Limbaugh? But if any of you ever listen to Rush Limbaugh, listen to this. Have you ever heard Rush Limbaugh do a show without having some conversation with Mr. Snurdly? Do you guys know who Mr. Snurdly is? Mr. Snurdly was a figment of Rush's imagination. It wasn't a real person. But like Tom Hanks on that island in Castaway, the human condition is that we all have a longing for belonging. We need somebody to talk to. We need somebody to listen to us. We need relationships. How many of you know that, that uh, Wilson the volleyball really should have won Best Supporting Actor <laughs> at the Academy Awards? Because I'm going to tell you something. Wilson the volleyball was really the star of that movie because it highlighted what Tom Hanks had really given up, what he had lost what he was missing. It wasn't just that his tooth hurt and he couldn't get to a dentist. It wasn't just that he didn't have drywall all around him when he slept at night. It wasn't that he couldn't walk into a grocery store and buy the food that he needed. All these other needs, he found creative ways to meet those needs. But that need, that longing for belonging was the one thing that he couldn't do by himself. Do you know life is something you can't do all by yourself? Christianity is something you cannot do all by yourself. Listen, Batman had Robin. Even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. And when God saves you and he calls you to himself, he makes you a part of his family. And I want to talk to you today about a house united. Notice just in those first six verses uh, <clears throat> that there's a, there's a famous saying, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. And if, if, you, if you look at this passage, it basically, Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16, you can outline it with those phrases. First of all, in verses 1 through 6, in essentials, there must be unity. In essentials, you got to have unity if you're taking notes. Look at those verses again. Verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. What is a worthy life? What is that calling? Verse 2, hum humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. You know what that means in the Greek? Let me give you a real uh, a good... Uh, uh, exegesis of those words. Are you ready? It means putting up with people. Wouldn't life be easy if it wasn't for all the people? He says, I want you to live a life worthy of the gospel, worthy of this calling. How do you do it? You got to be humble. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is just thinking of yourself less. 
How many of you think that's pretty good advice for marriage? Don't think less of yourself. Just think of yourself less. How many of you want to work in a company where everybody there thinks of themselves less and thinks about others? What does this mean for, for everybody? Uh, Michael Jordan famously said when his coach told him, Michael, there is no I in team. He said, well, there is in win. When Michael Jordan famously gave his speech at the National Basketball Association Hall of Fame, in his Hall of Fame speech, you can look it up on YouTube, it is the most hilarious, most bizarre Hall of Fame speech ever. Because you know what people do in Hall of Fame speeches? They thank everyone. They thank their high school coach, their college coach, their mom, their dad, their wife, their children, their teammates, their coaches, the organization that drafted them. The whole thing is a long thank you note. Not Michael Jordan. You know what he did in his Hall of Fame speech? He went back and took shots at everybody that he was still mad at after all these years including the general manager of the Chicago Bulls that he had a feud with that lasted a decade. Because when he beat the Utah Jazz in the NBA Finals with his last-minute shot and he won the game, Jerry Krause, the general manager of the Bulls, said to a reporter, individuals don't win championships. Organizations win championships. You know what Michael Jordan's response to that thought was? In his Hall of Fame speech, he repeated that quote. And then he said, I didn't see the organization playing with the flu in Utah. You think maybe Michael Jordan has some issues that he needs to think about? <clears throat> How many know that Michael Jordan played in the NBA and from the moment he arrived, he was the best player in the league. And he was the best player the league had seen in a generation. Listen to this. Michael Jordan did not win a championship his first nine seasons in the NBA. Everybody remembers the end of his career when he won all those championships in a row. He played for nine years where he was the best player on earth. He never even made it to the finals until Scottie Pippen came in. Friends, it's not the best players that win. It's the best teams that win. If you're a sports nut like I am, we are entering the holy season. I got a witness right over here. I just heard it. March Madness. Let me tell you why college basketball is the greatest sport in the world. Because I'm going to tell you something. It's where Princeton and James Madison and a tiny little Catholic school in Jersey City called St. Peter's can beat the Kentucky Wildcats and the Kansas Jayhawks and the North Carolina. In other words, it's where David can beat Goliath because you don't have to be the best players and you don't have to have the most talent. But if you're the best team and you play together and you play unselfishly, listen to me, the same principle applies in a church, in a home, in a business that applies in the locker room. Friends, from the locker room to the boardroom to the living room, to the bedroom. The secret to getting along is being humble, patient, bearing with one another in love. In all things, we need unity. He says, verse 3, make every effort. Make every effort. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever been in a situation at home or at work or in some kind of relational situation where you knew how to push somebody's buttons. 
you knew how to push their buttons. And you just walked them right into the briar patch with you. And you let them, you just cranked them up like a lawnmower and let them go. And then sat back so that you could win. The desire to win is the opposite of love. Can I tell you a little secret about your spouse and your children and your parents and your boss and your employees and your friends? Let me tell you a little secret about them you may not know. They're human beings and they have strengths and they have weaknesses. And if you want to follow them around with a legal pad and write down all their weaknesses, you're not ever, you're going to run out of ink before you run out of problems. But if you want to follow them around and celebrate them and love them and encourage them and be thankful for them, you know what? You're never going to run out of material either. They'll surprise you. And you might say, oh, you don't know who I'm living with. Well, I can tell you what, are they better than a volleyball? You know what my parents used to say about life and about dealing with adversity and difficulty, wherever it was, school, work, whatever, teams, they'd say, hey, Stephen, just remember, CTW. You know what that means? Compared to what? Whatever you're thinking about and whatever you're looking at that you're so frustrated about, compared to what? What are you so mad about? Because you didn't get the raise, or you don't have as much money as your neighbor, or you're not happy about your house or your car or your 401k? Hey, uh, have you been to Cuba lately? You compare yourself to some internet millionaire. Can I just tell you something? Everybody's not going to be an influencer and make a million dollars a year for showing people what bag you wear. And listen, if you can get it and it works, God bless you. We're happy for you. And please tithe. There are boxes in the back wall <laughs> back there. I'm not against you. I'm all for you. I'm just saying there, there's not enough people in the world. Everybody's not going to be rich. You say, but I want, I want diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want everything to be fair. You do? They tried that in the 20th century. That system doesn't make everyone rich. Communism is fair, all right, because it makes everyone poor. And by the way, you know all the people all over this planet that are risking their lives to get into this country? What drives them here is not just that this nation is supposed to be based on the principle of fairness. But I'm going to tell you, what's deep down in their belly that makes them want to be in America is that this nation is not just about fairness, but it's also about freedom and the ability to pursue your dream. You see, if everything was completely fair, it wouldn't be completely free. The only way you can have freedom is you acknowledge the cost of freedom is that it's not going to be the same for everyone. And what you can't do, you can't do is guarantee equality of outcomes. That's not possible. What we ought to do is guarantee equality of opportunity. And friends, if everybody's got the same chance, that's as fair as it gets. Listen to what he says. He says, the secret 
of getting along, putting up with people. Verse three, you got to make every effort to keep the unity of what? Does he say the unity of unity? No, it's the unity of the spirit. If tolerance is the only virtue in a society, all we believe in is tolerance, then what do we believe in at the end of the day? Nothing. Is it okay to molest children? Should we tolerate people who identify as child molesters? Incidentally, if you're offended by that comment, or you think I'm not being fair, follow the logic of that reasoning. Where does it take you? Well, I, if someone says, well, I identify as a child molester. That's just, you know, I'm attracted to children. What would we all stand up and say to that? You know, <clears throat> you know, I, I really am at a loss to explain, you know, our difference of opinion. You know, I think the only way to solve this would be for you to talk to God himself. Why don't we make that appointment for you right now? We can make that happen. We've got this chair up there in Stark we can put you in. And we're going to arrange that appointment so you can talk to him about that and explain it to him. Maybe he will understand something that I do not. Friends, tolerance is a virtue. We just read about it. Being humble, patient, bearing with one another. Christians, should Christians be tolerant? Nod your head like this. Just get some extra. Of course we should. Of course we should. We should, Jesus says, love everybody. He says, love your neighbor. He says, love your enemy. Can it be any more simple than that? Does that mean we ought to love people we disagree with? Sure. That's the basis of Bonnie and I's marriage right there. <laughs> is loving people that you disagree with. Love, hey, should you love people that are different from you? I hope so, or you're going to be lonely because everybody's different than you. In everything, in, in, in essentials, he says, we need unity. He says, and you've got to make every effort. This is, I think this is the flip side of the coin that says love is not easily offended. Don't you think that's the opposite? It's the flip side of the coin, the same coin. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians, love is not easily offended, What he's saying is, he's saying, hey, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. If you're a husband and you're not making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, then don't complain about your wife being offended. Don't tell your wife and quote 1 Corinthians 13 and say, well, you know, sweetheart, love is not easily offended, so you really shouldn't be offended about this. Or vice versa. She might turn around and say, well, you know, I'm not trying to be offended. The problem is you're not making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Same thing is true in a church, in a business. My boss is so difficult to deal with. Oh, yeah? Uh, Do you think you are a bed of roses? (laughs) If you think being a boss is so easy, why don't you go start a business? It's not for the faint of heart. It's not easy. You say, but you don't understand my boss. No. All I understand is this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And friends, it's not the unity of unity. It's not the unity of unity. It's the unity of the Spirit. In essentials, there's got to be unity. Friends, community requires unity. Listen to what he says in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Famous passage, very similar. Written to the church at Philippi. Therefore, Paul says, if you have any encouragement from being what? United. He says, if you want to have a house united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, 
any common sharing in the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion. Verse 2, he says, make my joy complete by being, say it with me, like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one mind. Do you know the word united, the word unity, the root word of the word union, unity, united, is the digit, one. The root word of unity, think of the card game, uno. Uno. Uno is where union comes from. It's not all about you. It's about unity. Christianity is not a me thing. Christianity at its very heart is a we thing. By the way, what did God the Father say in the Garden of Eden? He said, let us make man in our image. Even in the Godhead, there is fellowship, there's communion, there's partnership, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he invites us into that fellowship. He says, in essentials, there's got to be unity. He goes on in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. He says this, verse 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value, say it with me, others. Value others above yourselves, verse 4. He says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And what did Paul say about this? This way of living, this kind of lifestyle, the power of community, the power of unity, the power of connection. He said this. He said, the more unity there is, you're going to make my joy complete. And I'm going to tell you the secret, the secret to success and the secret to happiness. Friends, 80% of life is just the ability to get along with people. To get along with people. And I'm going to tell you something. When you're lying in a hospital bed in intensive care, or you're lying in a hospice bed, nobody from hospice ever said, can you bring my trophies and plaques? Can you bring my checkbook down here and my balance sheet? Let me just look at my stock portfolio one more time. Did anybody ever say that? Only a fool. What do people say? Can you get my kids on the phone? Can you get them? Is that you, my neighbor? I've lived next door to you for 30 years. You came to see me to say goodbye. What do people have in their offices? Pictures of their boats? Or pictures of their family and their friends? We have a longing for belonging. In essentials, Paul says there must be unity because community requires unity. Look at what he says in verses 7 to 13. Verses 7 to 13, he says, in essentials, there's unity, but in non-essentials, there's got to be liberty. You can write that down. Unity does not mean uniformity. Community does not mean conformity. It doesn't mean everybody has to think the same way. It doesn't mean everybody has to talk the same way, dress the same way, vote the same way. It means unity says, keeping the unity of the spirit means that I've got to learn how to learn from people who disagree with me. I got to learn how to live with people who are different from me. I got to learn how to love people who disappoint me. Listen to what he says in verse seven. He says, but to each one. Now remember in verses one through six, it's all about unity, right? The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Look at verse seven and he changes his tune a little bit. And he says, now, to each one of us. So the fact that we're united, that we're a house united, it doesn't take away our individuality. You're a singular person with with dignity and value and worth and significance. You have a fingerprint like nobody else. God has a purpose. God has a design, a plan just for you that is significant to his plan for us all. And he says, to each one, Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took away many captives, he gave gifts 
to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Look at verse 12. To do what? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up Until we all reach what? Unity in the faith. What is he saying? He's saying everybody's got to be a part of this family for us to reach the unity and the purpose for which God designed us. Is this church ever going to be what this church is supposed to be without each one of you? Without each one of us? Helen Keller said we can do so little alone. We can do so much together. There's so little we can do all by ourselves, but there's so much that we can do when we all work together. It's a beautiful thing. He says in essentials, there's got to be unity. But in non-essentials, there needs to be liberty. There needs to be freedom. Everybody can serve in their own unique their own unique way. A pastor's job is to equip you for works of service that the body be built up till we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Remember that last week we talked about how it was immeasurable? The love of God is measureless and strong. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably above and beyond all that you could ask or think. In this verse, he says, we need each other to attain to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Remember, God can do more with your life than you can. He can do immeasurably more. How does he do it? One of the ways he does more with your life than you can do on your own is he surrounds you with people that love you and encourage you and share with you and bring out the best in you. Here's the secret. Learn how to see the best in other people. How many of you are able to see the worst in other people? Are you like me? It's not hard to see the worst in people. They will show you the worst in them. But listen, maturity and being other-centered and being Christ-like is about seeing the best in other people. And then he says, not only do you have to see the best in people, but you got to bring the best out of people. Sometime when you're frustrated with somebody, I mean, you're just, you, let's be honest, I mean, you're just irritated. You're really irritated and you're really frustrated. Just say to yourself, this is not their best. And I'm not going to let this situation keep me from seeing their best best. And my job is to make every effort, try to bring the best out of them. And let me tell you one of the ways you can do that. Seeing the best, bringing out the best, means giving your best. When you see somebody who's at their worst, that's not an excuse for you to be at your worst. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Hate doesn't drive out hate. Darkness doesn't drive out darkness. Only light drives out darkness. And friends, Martin Luther King said, hate can't drive out hate. Only love can drive out hate. And so when I catch somebody at their worst, friend, that's the time I've got to be at my best. I've got to see the best. I've got to pray and seek to bring out the best. And man, I've got to give my very best. Can I make a confession to you as a pastor? You want to know the truth? I got a friend who's a pastor's son right here on the fifth row, fourth row there. And you know it's true. When you're a pastor... 
there's a sense in which you feel like you've got to be on. You know what I'm talking about? Patrick, you've served as a pastor in a church. You know the feeling where you walk on the property and you've got to be on. And when you live like that day after day and week after week where every person you interact with, you're interacting with them just randomly, but you're the only pastor they're interacting with that day. They're going to remember what you said. They're going to remember how you acted. They're going to remember that you forgot their birthday. Bonnie and I have talked about this so many times. We were in a restaurant This guy was kind of a nominal attender at our church, came by. Hey, Pastor Stephen. And I looked back at him with all the love in my heart and said, hey, man. How you doing, guy? Brother, it's good to see you. If I ever say, hey, man, to you, don't be offended. And he said, oh, man, hey, I haven't seen you in years. I've been to the church in a long, long time. I said, man, how's your dad? Pastor, my father passed away two years ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that. Bonnie's saying I probably shouldn't share this story. I said, I'm so sorry to hear that. I didn't know. Pastor, you did the ceremony. Pastor, you did the ceremony. Oh. Can I make a confession to you? That's not the worst part of this story. Here's the worst part of the story. The worst part of the story is That's what I'm capable of when I think I'm on all the time. Would you like to see me when I'm off? Because you know what a lot of us pastors do? We're kind of like the rest of you where we can be on around other people. And then when we go home, you know what happens sometimes when you go home? You're tired of being on all the time. And so you just want to turn off. Now, is that giving your best to the people that matter most? Is that making every effort to keep the unity. You know why I'm telling this story, don't you? First of all, it's a confession, but secondly, hopefully, it's making you feel a little bit better about yourself. Friends, we're all just human beings. We're all broken people in a broken world. But Jesus calls us to a better way to live. He says it's a worthy life. It's a high calling. It's It's a life that's worthy of the calling that you've received. He says, here's what you got to have. In essentials, there's got to be unity. In non-essentials, there's got to be liberty. Everybody's got a job to do, and everybody's job matters. And he says, you've got to equip people for works of service. He says in uh, in verse 12, to equip his people for works of service that the body of Christ may be built up. Let me tell you about the problem with you not being here. And this is not a guilt trip, because I know sometimes you can't be here. And this is not about guilt, but it's about the power of connection. The reality is, when you're not here, it's not just that you don't receive God's gifts and God's blessing and God's grace in ways that would help you. But the reality is, you're here to be equipped for works of service that God prepared in advance for you to do. 
so that the body of Christ may be built up. So when you're not here, who's doing all that building that you're going to do? Who's doing the building up? The people that you're going to disciple, the people you're going to comfort, the people you're going to encourage. Who's encouraging them when you're not here? It's not just what you miss when you're not connected. You say, Pastor Stephen, I love church, but I'm not in a grace group. I've never been in a group, and I don't know that I really need that. Well, you know what? Maybe you don't need it as much as those people need you in their group. Maybe there's somebody in that group that you're the one person that God's going to use to do a deep, deep work of grace in their lives. God, friends, God raises up people to do his work. How many of you are, you know, Mark and Kelly Green, our children's minister, Kelly Green? Do you remember how many kids were here when she started a year ago? A little over a year ago. You know how many children were here on a Sunday morning, their first Sunday in the, in the church? I, I took attendance in the middle of my sermon. Pastor Stephen, how do you take attendance in the middle of a sermon? I counted up all the children in the children's ministry while I was standing here preaching because at about 10.30 when I saw Mark and Kelly slip in the back door and come in and have a seat, I figured out that no one came, not one child, on their first Sunday. You want to talk about starting from scratch? She started from scratch. You know how many children were there last Wednesday night, three nights ago? 40 children on Wednesday night next door in that room. They had, they've had dozens of kids pray to receive Christ at North Andrews Elementary School this year through game day. They've got 50, 60 kids coming every week to game day. They've got 80 kids registered. And they've dozens and dozens of kids have made decisions for Christ. Can I tell you something? <clears throat> God calls people particular people to a particular place for a particular purpose. You think maybe God called Kelly Green to our church to work in the kids' ministry? Now listen to me. If you believe that, and you believe this verse, it begs the question, what's he calling me to do? You say, Pastor Stephen, I know he's not calling me to reach kids. I wouldn't last five minutes in there. Pat Panera, can I get an amen? Amen. Listen, <clears throat> it doesn't mean you've got to do it like anybody else. It doesn't mean it has to look like anybody else. Some of you say, but what I really love is golf. Well, guess what? Where's Lynn Freedy? Is Lynn here today? She may be next door working in the kids' ministry. Lynn Freedy's next door working in the kids' ministry. You know Why? Because on a golf course, a golf pro told her about Jesus 15 or 20 years ago. She gave her life to Christ. She's over there working in the kids' ministry at a church, something she could never have fathomed before that moment. What do you like to do? What do you enjoy? You know what Mark Bowers likes to do? He likes to grill up barbecue. Well, how in the world could you grill up barbecue and make that a ministry? Why don't you talk to him? He'll tell you all about it. We're going to do it up here in just a couple months. And uh, how many of you think it builds us all up? Builds me up. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you, God can use whatever gift you have, whatever passion you have, Whatever desire, delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. In essentials, there's got to be unity. In non-essentials, there's got to be liberty. Because community requires unity, and unity desires liberty. Bruce, I'm going to skip First Peter. We're going to go on to the next and final point for the sake of time. Number three, in all things, charity. In all things, charity. Charity, love. Listen to what it says in verses 14 to 16. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, 
by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. He says it's time to grow up. Don't be a child. Don't be juvenile. Don't be immature. He says, grow up. Stop being unstable. He says, toss to and fro by the waves. In other words, every circumstance that happens. Friend, when you're in the hospital and the doctor comes to see you, and they pick up that magic clipboard, and they stand there with that white magic coat and their little nameplate that adores, adorns them with genius and expertise and credibility. Have you ever noticed how when that doctor says something to you, it always sounds good or bad? Have you ever noticed that? Every day they come in and talk to you. They'll tell you something that makes you sound good and happy, or they'll tell you something that makes it sound bad and discouraging. And here's my advice. Don't get too excited when it sounds good. And don't get too depressed when it sounds... Don't start planning your funeral because they told you something that sounds bad. They have to tell you what's on the chart. But the chart is not the Lord of all creation. The chart is not the God of this universe. And if your life is in God's hands, and guess what? All things are going to work together for the good according to his purpose, to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. He says, don't be a child. Don't be an infant. Grow up. And he says, verse 15, how do you grow up? Instead, what has he just talked about? He's just talked about spiritual infancy. Now he's going to talk about spiritual maturity. He's going to contrast childish behavior with mature behavior. Verse 15, instead, Speaking the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. In other words, you're going to grow in maturity. You're going to grow in community. You're going to grow to Christ-likeness. How? By speaking the truth in love. You've got to balance grace and truth. How do you do that? It's easy to speak in love if you're not worried about speaking the truth. It's easy to speak the truth if you're not bothered and held back by the limits of love and mercy. The art and science of communication is the ability to speak the truth, but to do it in love. Listen to what it says in John chapter 1, verse 17. Look at the screen. John chapter 1 and verse 17. <clears throat> For the law was given through Moses. The law. Isn't the law truth? The law is the revealed will of God, the truth about God. He says the law was given through Moses. Moses walked down off the mountain and he handed the people these tablets and told them, this is the truth. This is the way to live. He says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. When Jesus came, was he wearing sandals and playing acoustic guitar and smoking a joint and telling everybody that they were okay? that I'm okay and you're okay and we're all just going to sit around this fireside and be groovy. Is that what he said? People in our culture today have emasculated Jesus. Turn him into this fruitcake. As if they've somehow never heard his words I didn't come to send peace, but a sword. The prince of peace said, hey, I didn't come just for peace and peace alone. I didn't come for unity for the sake of unity. I came for the unity of the spirit. I came for unity in the faith. And he says, here's how you grow spiritually. You speak the truth in love to build up the body, and build up others. Someone has said, 
the hardest conversation is usually the one you need to have the most. The hardest conversation is usually the one that you need to have the most. Speak the truth, but do it in love. Jesus was different. Jesus was God in the flesh. The, 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 the definition of spiritual maturity, what is it? Are you spiritually mature? Think about it. Are you? Are you spiritually mature? You know why most people don't know the answer to that question? Because they don't know how to define and measure spiritual maturity. Most people think, well, how long have I been a Christian? Let's see. When did I come to Christ? Is that spiritual maturity? How long you've been saved? And somebody else says, well, he went to seminary. He knows a lot about the Bible. Is knowledge of the Bible, is that synonymous with spiritual maturity? The more you know about the Bible, the more spiritual mature you are. The suspense is killing me. What is spiritual maturity? Here's what it is. It is nothing more and nothing less than Christ-likeness. Spiritual maturity is about being like Christ. Thinking like him, feeling what he feels, saying what he would say, doing what he would do. You say, Pastor Stephen, by that definition, none of us are spiritually mature. Well, not yet. Not 100%. Are you ever going to be just like Christ? Up in the glory you will be, right? We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he really is. So spiritual maturity on this planet, in this lifetime, practically speaking, just means this. Are you closer to being like Jesus today than you were a year ago? Well, if you're more like Christ today than you used to be, then you're becoming more spiritually mature. It's not like something you arrive at. The Apostle Paul said, I have not arrived, but here's what I do, pressing on toward the goal, toward the prize of the high calling of God. I forget the past. I leave the past behind. I get past my past, and I press on towards the goal. And I want, what I want to do is I want to be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. How many of you think that's what God wants for Grace Point Church? Would he like us to be a little bit more like Jesus today than we were yesterday and next week than this week? I'm climbing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. <clears throat> Lead me on to higher In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Community requires unity. Unity desires liberty, and liberty inspires charity. Let me tell you what love is. Love is just unity with its work boots on. You come together. Henry Ford said, here's what it's like. Here's success. He said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. A house united, changing the world one life at a time for the glory of God. How do you do it? <clears throat> Unity. We got to be one. Oneness is not sameness. All lamps are not the same, but all lamps are light. The light is the same. Unity gives way to liberty. Liberty means everybody's got to do their part. Everybody's got to pull their weight. Everybody's got to be 
a part of this family, a part of this team. Every member counts. Every member's a minister, and every minister's a missionary. And then that liberty and that freedom and that uniqueness is going to express itself in love, in loving others, loving each other. Can I tell you one of the greatest apologetics? My friend Alan here is, uh, is, is big into apologetics. Ben loves apologetics. And, uh, and so when you're talking to people about the faith, you're trying to answer their questions. Listen, is apologetics important? Yeah, the Bible says always be ready to give an answer. Listen to this. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. But you know what some apologetics is? Some apologetics is answering questions that people have not asked you. The most powerful apologetics is answering the question that people really have. Sometimes I'll be talking to somebody about the faith and they'll say, but what about people who've never heard? And what about the problem of evil? And how can you believe in God when there's DNA? And and how do you explain evolution? And what do you say about this, that, and the other? And what about slavery? And what about the Holocaust? And what about all these TV preachers that get caught in trouble? And what about Christians that do things wrong? And blah, 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 blah. And I always say to them the same thing. I say, that's a fair question. And I'd be glad to try to answer that question. If I don't know the answer, I'll try to find an answer for you. But could I ask you a question? If I answer that question to your intellectual satisfaction, would you be ready to get on your knees right now and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And invariably, you know what they say? No. No, 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 I'm not ready to do that. And I say, well then, that's not really the question, is it? What's the real question? And can I tell you one of the greatest forms of apologetics that you can have? It's not just, and and it's important to know the answers and to be able to help people, you know, find solutions and get over obstacles to faith. It's very significant, very important. But can I tell you, A lot of people's problems with faith are not intellectual in nature. There are some. They're real. They need to be addressed. Let me tell you what a lot of people's problems with faith are. They're emotional in nature. You know what they need to see? They need to see that this love thing actually works. You know why they have a hard time praying to a father in heaven? And saying, hallowed be thy name, because they had a father on earth that they couldn't trust. You know why they don't want to go to church to meet all their brothers and sisters in Christ? You know why that's not exciting to them? Because they don't speak to their brothers and sisters on this earth. They've had unhealthy relationships. They've had unresolved conflicts. they got pain. They've got hurt. And you know what they really need? They need to see love. How many of you are familiar? And we're through, all right? Relax. We're done. Are you ready? Last one. I promise. How many of you are familiar with the pop culture sensation of Travis and Jason Kelsey in the NFL? You know, the Kelsey brothers have this podcast. It's like taking the world by storm. Jason Kelsey retired from the Philadelphia Eagles. And he's going to make more money doing a podcast once a week for 45 minutes than he made playing football 80 hours a week for the Philadelphia Eagles. Here's your choice, Jason. You can go back to his training camp and two-a-days and banging heads against guys who weigh 50 pounds more than you every day for a season. Or we'll give you twice as much money to sit in an air-conditioned room and tell jokes with your brother. Jason made the wise choice, and he retired. You guys familiar with this thing on ESPN called the Manning Cast? 
It's during Monday Night Football where Peyton and Eli Manning watch Monday Night Football with their heads in a screen and they have guests on, one in the first quarter, one in the second quarter, one in the third quarter, one in the fourth quarter, and they just talk and hang out and watch the game and basically tell jokes. It's the equivalent of sitting on a bar stool with Peyton and Eli Manning and watching a football game. Listen up. Is what those guys are saying about the game really all that different from what you hear on the other broadcasts? Does anybody remember anything that Travis or Jason Kelsey has ever said on that podcast? Is there some memorable line where, oh, I remember the day he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. No, they don't talk like that. It's very forgettable. I don't, I'm not trying to ridicule them. It's very entertaining and enjoyable. But friends, it's not the content that is so captivating. You know what I think a lot of people like about it? Doesn't it just feel good to see two brothers who love each other and get along and support one another. And it just makes you feel like that's the way it's supposed to be. Brothers are supposed to love one another. That's the life that we've been called to. That's what's worthy of the calling that we've received. And so in essentials, there's going to be unity. And in non-essentials, there's got to be liberty. But in all things, there's going to be charity. Because I need others. I need them. And they need me. Amen? Let's bow our hearts and pray. Our heads are bowed all over this room. If you're joining us online, wherever you are, I'm going to tell you, Jesus came so that you would never be alone again. He's the lover of your soul. He said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And he said, I don't want heaven without you. <clears throat> and he said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to, to myself. Jesus died on the cross to take away all your sin. God demonstrated his love and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You say, Pastor Stephen, I don't know what I need, but I know I need something. Could be that God brought you here to hear these words. It's not something you need, it's someone. You can find him, you can meet him here today. Just make this your prayer. You say, Pastor Stephen, I want to know Christ. I want to go God's way today. I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. Make this your prayer. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. The best I know how, I put my life in your hands. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead. I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord. And make this your prayer. If you prayed that prayer, you mean it in your heart, just say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. If you're a believer and you know Christ, would you just take a moment and pray for someone you know who needs to know Christ. Just take a moment right now. You're thinking of them. You can see them in your mind's eye. And just say a prayer. Jesus, draw them to yourself. Isn't that an easy prayer to pray? Let me give you a more dangerous one. You ready? Make this your prayer. God, use me this week. To help bring the gospel to my friend, to my family, to that person. God, use me this week to throw out a lifeline to somebody who needs to know Christ. Lord, use all these opportunities we have of lunch this week and night of worship and Palm Sunday and the kids and the egg hunt and Easter and the 28-day adventure, and all the things that we're going to have in the next few weeks, God, use these opportunities. Help us to see the part that we can play to make a difference in somebody's life and to bring unity to the body, 
to help us all be built up to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. For Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray, amen. flyers in the back. Bobby, can you help us, Tim? We got a bunch of these flyers here we're going to be handing out. Take, a, take as many of these as you can. Let's give them all out this week. Night of Worship, Saturday, March 23rd, 7 p.m. It's going to be unbelievable. Maya, we're excited. We're looking forward to it. Going to be praying. Appreciate all you guys. Let's tell all these folks how much we appreciate them. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to Saturday. Bring somebody you know who wants to have a great time, wants to have a great night, be encouraged, be in the presence of God. This Saturday at 7 p.m. Hope you'll be here and be a part of it. Wednesday, if you're free for lunch, 11.30, join us right here in the fellowship hall. There's gonna be a great physician who's gonna be with us. It's Paul's doctor. Several people in our church, Tanya's nodding her head. He's helped a lot in different ways. And so it'll be a lot of fun and he'll also be sharing his testimony. And so come out and join us for lunch. Wednesday, 11.30. Don't forget, next Sunday, the kids are going to be a part of worship with palm branches waving and excited. The following Sunday is Easter. It's going to be an unbelievable day. We're going to have a huge egg hunt, and we're praying there's going to be scores and scores of families and kids here that we're going to reach out to. <clears throat> As you leave today, there's boxes in the back. You can drop your offering in the box. Every time you give, you're helping change the world one life at a time. If you're online, go to gracepoint.net. Click on the word donate or give. Take 60 seconds and you can uh, help make a difference. We appreciate your gifts. We're going to have a meeting right after this service, right down front in just a couple of minutes. Come join us, Tanya, Pat, and I, and others will be here, small group leaders. Or if you're interested in hosting or leading a group for this four-week campaign called One Love, a 28-day adventure in Ephesians, join me right here. We're going to meet for 20, 30 minutes and just have a way for you to get some information if you're interested in being a part of that. If you prayed with me to receive Christ, 
online. You can go to gracepoint.net and you can let us know. Connect with us so we can get some Bible study material to you. Pat Panera is standing in the back. If you're here in the room and you prayed that prayer, when you leave today, we've got a special gift bag. You just go back there and say, I prayed that prayer with Pastor Stephen. And they're going to give you a book that has material about how to grow in your faith. We want to encourage you. And uh, Aaron, excuse me, Aaron and Ron, wave your hand back there in the back corner. Aaron and Ron are going to help us today, prayer team. So as you leave, if you want somebody to pray with you, pray for you, you can see them. And uh, they would love to take you to the throne of grace and prayer. God bless you for being here today. How many of you are glad you came to church today? Amen? God bless you. God bless you. Let's stand. God bless you for being here. Be dismissed.